Test one, two, test one, two. So when that year first 
But no, 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 it's like too small. No, 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 no,
to go through the last Okay. So this was going well done. So I got this. Yeah, they did great. They did good. Yeah. It has. I'm going to change. Yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay.
and I
on, but we're not really ready for them. No, no, I don't have to bother. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event. This is our last uh, afternoon of the our last event of the semester. My staff knows exactly about what's going to happen because they're just walking out the door. Um, can you grab Jen Smith real quick? So I work, anyone who's run anything knows um, that uh, these events are a lot of work and everything we do is a lot of work. I have the best staff um, at Notre Dame. And so Jen Smith and Soren Greffenstadt and Mary Frances Myler uh, and Debbie O'Malley here, who's going to introduce our speaker. I just want to thank these ladies for just, you guys are tremendous. And thank you for all that. For those undergraduates here, uh, the center directs the university's minor in constitutional studies. You should talk to, to Debbie or myself or to Soren if you're interested in the minor. Um, uh, if undergraduates so well, we run the, the Tocqueville Fellowship. The Tocqueville Fellows meet with our speakers. They help us plan events. They sort of get a, um, a first class seat to everything we do. And you should talk to Soren about the Tocqueville Fellowship. Soren, Applications for the fellowship are due after finals. Is that right? Okay. So talk to uh, Soren if you're interested in being um, an undergraduate, being uh, more involved with the center. Um, one announcement for the link. So I'm teaching a class with Dr. Zucker right now on Lincoln's political thought. Um, so thank you to the class for sharing your class time uh, with the university. Um, and we will meet um, right after the lecture so we can get a, a picture with our uh, distinguished faculty, and then we'll have class right after downstairs. But stick around right after the lecture so we can get a picture. Um, okay, I'm going to introduce um, in a second Debbie O'Malley to introduce our speaker. Usually we have a student, but I want to 
introduce uh, Professor O'Malley to you. But let me just say a, a few words about Professor Zuckert. Um, I have been team teaching a class on Lincoln with him this semester. I came to Notre Dame uh, in 2009, uh, in large part uh, because I wanted to be his colleague. Um, it, it's just been a tremendous experience uh, to teach his class. I, I've been reading his book. Jack, can I grab the copy of the book? I know we have a lot of people watching online. Um, so we've been, uh, the book just came out, uh, A Nation So Conceived, Abraham Lincoln and the Paradox of Democratic Sovereignty. Just came out this week, I think was published. Um, uh, I've been reading the book, um, the manuscript, as we've been teaching. I think it's the best book on Lincoln written this century. And it will be Professor Zuckert's lasting contribution uh, to American political science and to America. So it's a tremendous honor for me uh, to bring my friend back. Uh, to do a proper introduction, uh, Professor O'Malley, let me introduce Debbie to you. Uh, Debbie O'Malley is our new Associate Director of the Center. Uh, we're just delighted to have her here. Um, she's a Baylor PhD, uh, Assumption Ashland University undergraduate. And I like to think she would have been a uh, Constitutional Studies minor had she gone to another game. So, Debbie? Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Um, as a longtime student of the American founding, it's truly an honor for me to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Zuckert, who is the Nancy R. Drew Professor of Political Science Emeritus here at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Zuckert is one of our nation's most profound and prolific scholars of the American founding. And he has published extensively in both political theory and constitutional studies. His books include Natural Rights and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic, Launching Liberalism, and co-authored with Catherine Zuckert, The Truth About Leo Strauss and Leo Strauss and the uh, Problem of Political Philosophy. In addition to authoring these books and many articles, he has edited several volumes, including The Spirit of Religion and the Spirit of, Liberty, of Liberty, and with Derek Webb, the anti-federal writings of the Melanchthon Smith Circle. He is also the founding editor of American Political Thought, a journal of ideas, institutions, and culture. His latest book, and the reason we are all here, is called A Nation So Conceived, Abraham Lincoln and the Paradox of Democratic Sovereignty. Professor Zuckert received his Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University, and he received his master's and his PhD from the University of Chicago. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Zuckert to guide us in thinking about Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest. Well, Debbie, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank Philip Munoz for uh, putting on this event. Um, I have to say that uh, he has been a wonderful colleague over all these years, and a, more than that, a great friend. Um, I would say it was one of the two best things I did in my time as department chair and really in my whole time at Notre Dame to help bring him here. So um, thank you again for all that you've done in our lives. Uh, the title of my talk, as you just heard, is uh, Thinking About Lincoln. Um, it's a fitting talk to give, I think, uh, at a launch event for my book because it was the first public presentation of my thoughts on Lincoln. And in revised form, it made it into my book as chapter five, if you, if you have a book and, and happen to read it. If I were to rewrite the speech I'm about to give today, or yesterday even, I would probably do some of it differently. But in the interest of historical authenticity, I have kept it as it was in 1992 on its maiden appearance. Now, I wanna start with the idea that Lincoln is now regularly named by the experts on the presidency as our greatest president ever. Yet, despite that, he has actually come in for much criticism, both in his day and after. Um, 
In fact, there have been, uh, in the 20th century and tailing into the 21st century, there have been two major waves of criticism of Lincoln, corresponding roughly to the first half of the 20th century and then uh, to the second. The first was sponsored by some of the great historians of the Civil War of previous generations, who came to consider Lincoln's statecraft, especially as practiced in the Civil War period. Their criticism of Lincoln goes something like this. Um, he took an overly radical and moralistic position in the pre-war period, and together with the abolitionists and some other more radical Republicans, uh, he transformed a conflict that could have been compromised and settled in a peaceful way into a situation with all the earmarks of a Greek tragedy. The Civil War was not actually inevitable in itself, according to this line of thinking, but Lincoln and his friends made it so by their intransigence. Lincoln famously said, as probably most of you have heard, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe, he said, this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. These historians believe that Lincoln, by pronouncing and acting on the principles of this house divided speech, created the situation and the climate of opinion in which the South could do nothing but see his election as a declaration of war against them and give them no choice but to leave the Union. At the same time, Lincoln said, same speech, that he did not expect the Union to be dissolved. He did not expect the House to fall, but he did expect it will cease to be divided. Now, what Lincoln stated here is a mere prediction turned out to be for him an imperative of, of policy, and he was resolved not to allow the dissolution of the Union. So the now unstoppable force of Lincoln-inspired Southern fear met the immovable object of Lincolnian resolve to maintain the Union. And once the issue was defined that way, the result, these historians think, was as inevitable as Oedipus killing his father. Now, so this line of argument about the Civil War and Lincoln became powerful during the first half of the 20th century and was associated with a national reassessment of the end result of that war. If you remember, the segregation system had replaced slavery in the South, while Northern opinion lost all zeal for any sort of civil rights agenda, all zeal for remaking Southern society, or for attending really to sexually divisive issues that might interfere with the um, explosive economic expansion that was uh, the country was undergoing in this period. Reading backward from the national accommodation to the, quote, peculiar racial patterns in the South, Americans began to wonder whether the Civil War, which up until World War I was the most destructive war in human history, people began to wonder whether the Civil War had been worth it. Many historians, breathing in the spirit of their own age, redefined the war as preventable, with Lincoln and the abolitionists as the chief villains in snatching war from the jaws of peace. Now, the historians varied a good deal in the motivations that they attributed to Lincoln. Some thought it was just an instance of poor judgment. For example, that he didn't understand what kind of war it would actually be. At the outbreak of fighting, he called for 75,000 volunteers to, to serve a three-month enlistment period. A small, quick war. To put these numbers in some sort of perspective, however, we should recall that the Civil War left nearly 620,000 dead on both sides before it was all over four years later. Others see the episode even in less favorable terms to Lincoln. One very famous essay by a very well-known American historian called Abraham Lincoln and the Self-Made Myth attributed all of Lincoln's actions to nothing more noble than his soaring personal ambition. He was willing to risk all, to risk the future of his country and the lives of his countrymen so that he might hold high office. 
So ironically, the charges raised against Lincoln in the second half of the 20th century are more or less the opposite to those raised earlier. Not his intransigence, but his half-heartedness, the narrowness of his motives, actions, and views, the deep conservatism of all that he did and said in that time were the new targets. This line of thought about Lincoln emerged as you might guess, in the wake of the civil rights movement. Lincoln, these critics insist, may have signed the document that freed the slaves, but he didn't like, much like black people, did not want to free slaves, favored the interests of whites only, and did not see America as a place for whites and blacks to live together. In the final analysis, these charges amount to the dread accusations of racism, conservatism, he revered the works of the fathers, after all, and pro-capitalism. He frequently spoke of the virtues of free markets. Now, two sets of charges together, these two are, are very serious. On the one hand, Lincoln is held to be drastically deficient in his statecraft, deficient politically. In the other case, he's held to be deficient morally. <clears throat> now, I'd like to deal with these two sets of charges against him in terms of the question, was Lincoln right or was Stephen A. Douglas right in their great debates? Now, these debates centered on a very simple question. What should national policy be with respect to the presence or absence of slavery in the territories belonging to the United States? The territories in question were largely that part of the country then called Kansas, Nebraska, quite a large part of the country, if you had a map of it in front of you. Lincoln and Douglas were running against each other, you may know, for the privilege of being senator from Illinois. Here was an election campaign in which the candidates treated the half-educated electorate who turned out in droves and sat for three or more hours as intelligent, informed, or at least capable of being informed and capable of judging for themselves about the most important issues facing them as citizens. I'm not going to pause to make the obvious comparison to electioneering candidates and the electorate in our time. Now, in these debates, each candidate stood for one policy. Douglas for the policy of territorial self-determination, or as he called it, popular sovereignty. Lincoln stood, on the other hand, for the prohibition of slavery in these territories, or at least in the northern part. Uh, of the old Missouri Compromise line. Douglas's policy of uh, popular sovereignty was, one might say, a brilliant solution to an intractable problem of politics, both high and low. His policy itself was very simple. Instead of Congress deciding whether slavery would or would not be allowed to exist in the territories, as had been the approach taken in America, since the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, Douglas proposed instead that the people of each territory be allowed to settle this question for themselves. The issue was especially important for if slavery was once planted in a territory, it would pretty much inevitably come into the Union as a slave state and vice versa. Given the way representation in the Senate works and the role of senatorial representation in the Electoral College, the relative number of free and slave states was a matter of central concern to all sections of the nation. Therefore, the strongest political passions were brought to bear on Congress in its attempt to deal with the territories. All of national politics was caught up in the sectional conflict and it was explosive. Now, Douglas's solution was elegant. The principle of America, he said, is self-government. Therefore, let each territory govern themselves, decide for themselves. Why should Washington dictate a solution? Does that sound familiar? Um, Douglas thought he had found a way to settle what appeared to be a union-threatening conflict. The center of conflict would no longer be Washington, but would be the local territories. Now, this was, I think, a masterful effort to deflect and disarm conflict. 
It was an effort to avoid what was becoming the most contentious element of this conflict, which was for Congress to make a pronouncement on the subject uh, of this subject of slavery amounted to a national endorsement of the principles and institutions of one or the other section of the country and implicitly a rejection of the other. Since Congress had forbidden slavery in the past, the Southerners felt as though their special institutions and values were disvalued by the nation. The South felt slighted and demanded that its institutions be recognized as equally valuable. Now, Douglass's popular sovereignty gave the South at least some of what it wanted. If not national endorsement of slavery, then at least a secession of the implicit national condemnation of slavery. Under Douglass's popular sovereignty policy, the federal government is to remain strictly neutral <clears throat> between the Northern principles of freedom and Southern principles of slavery. As Douglass frequently said when he was out on the, on the hustings campaigning, he didn't care whether slavery was voted up or down, just that it be voted. But Douglass was not so personally neutral as these statements imply. He did not particularly wish to see slavery spread and thought that his policy would not in fact lead to that result. He believed that slavery took root or not, not because of laws, but because of physical conditions. Some climates and the resulting agricultural systems were suited to slavery and other climates are not. Not law, but nature would decide where slavery would go. And thus, as he thought, the divisive political battles could be avoided in a way that made no difference to the ultimate outcome. So Douglas's position was, you might say, a statesmanly position. It aimed to promote political pre peace and harmony and to avoid both the disunion on the one hand or civil war on the other. No wonder some historians came to condemn Link, uh, Lincoln for intransiently framing the issue in such a way as to prevent Douglas's specific and apparently humane policy from succeeding. Now, it must be said at the outset that Lincoln did everything in his power to prevent the country from adopting Douglas's policy of popular sovereignty. He had mostly dropped out of politics by 1850 after one term in Congress. He had turned his attention more seriously to his legal practice and his family than ever before. And he seemed resolved to make his life outside of politics. However, his plans changed in 1854. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed and that act made Douglas's popular sovereignty approach the law of the land in place of and explicitly repealing the Missouri Compromise which had a policy of prohibiting slavery outright in the large portion of those territories. Lincoln's change of direction was remarkable. He turned back to politics with one object only, to show the perniciousness of the Douglas policy and the corresponding, as he put it, propriety of the restoration of the Missouri Compromise. He insisted that the question of substantive principle the question of the inherent right or wrong of slavery could not be pushed aside in favor of the purely procedural solution of popular sovereignty. Now, this may seem to be the obviously right answer, but we can't rest so easy with it. Conceding that Lincoln is correct about the moral evil of slavery, it's still a fact that he was not about to change the minds of the slaveholders or their allies. Moreover, he was far from an abolitionist himself. He conceded that despite the moral wrong of slavery, only the states where it existed had the right or the power to do anything about it under the constitution. And he knew that they were not about to abolish slavery anytime soon. So it's not at all clear then what good could follow from Lincoln's policy, but it certainly was clear to Douglas that much political evil could follow, an intensified return to all of the political conflict 
that had been in place before 1854. So Lincoln's position, in other words, could look to be quite irresponsible. Now in 1854, during his speech on the Missouri Compromise repeal, he explained quite lucidly why he left his somewhat lucrative, lucrative law practice and took it upon himself to speak out against the leading politician in Illinois and really one of the leading politicians in the entire nation. It was because, he tells us, I hate this declared indifference to the spread of slavery. Hatred, a pretty strong sentiment from a man who at the end of a war that filled almost everybody with hatred, preached malice toward none and charity for all. Lincoln hated the policy of indifference to slavery expansion and came out of semi-retirement to voice that hatred and to try to make others feel it also. I hate it, he said in 1854, because of the monstrous injustice of slavery. I hate it because it deprives a Republican example of its just influence in the world. And especially I hate it because it forces so many good men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principle of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting there is no right principle of action but self-interest. So Lincoln hates Douglas's policy for its effects on three different groups. First, on the slaves themselves as victims of the monstrous injustice of slavery. Second, on those foreigners who are enemies to America and republicanism and who are hardened by the existence of slavery in a land claiming to be free. For this proves to them the hypocrisy of the Americans. Samuel Johnson, the maker of, of uh, dictionaries, famously said at the time of the American Revolution, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? And third, finally, Lincoln hates the effect on, as he put it, many good men amongst ourselves because it leads them into opposition to the Declaration of Independence and its principles. Lincoln was definitely onto something when he saw slavery as turning many individuals against the Declaration of Independence. Senator John Pettit of the great sovereign state of Indiana, in which we find ourselves today, in fact, on the floor of the Senate, called the Declaration of Independence a self-evident lie. From Lincoln's point of view, perhaps the most discouraging sign of the war slavery provoked against the Declaration was the decision by the US Supreme Court in the infamous Dred Scott case. There, the Chief Justice of the United States said that the Declaration could not possibly have been meant to apply to members of the African race who, he concluded, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This is the fulfillment to a T of what Lincoln had feared. He feared that good men would reject the very principles of political right and instead insist there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Now, all three of Lincoln's policies, uh, sorry, all three of Lincoln's points end up being variants of his first point <clears throat> that Douglas's policy ignores the monstrous injustice of slavery. It is this injustice that robs American institutions of their power of example in the world and that threatens to rob America of its own commitment to right principles of political action. It is not so much slavery in itself that does these bad things as the Douglas approach to slavery, that is to the declaration of official indifference to its rightness or wrongness. Lincoln thought slavery a monstrous injustice, but he thought it would have to be lived with for the time being and that it could be, so long as the prohibition on the spread of slavery remained in the law to serve two crucial purposes at least. First, to affirm the inherent wrong of slavery by not being neutral about it. And second, to give the public mind reason, as he put it, to believe that slavery was in course of ultimate extinction. In that second wave of criticism after the start of the civil rights movement, Lincoln was blamed for being 
so tolerant of slavery as this, blamed for opposing intransigently and immediately not the evil itself, but the peripheral matter of the spread of the evil, all the while affirming his willingness to tolerate the evil where it existed. Lincoln apparently hated Douglass's indifference about slavery even more than he hated the evil of slavery. But we can understand his reasons for opposing Douglass's effort at a statesmanly settlement, as well as his reasons for not going further in an abolitionist direction, only by listening to what he says about the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. His central argument against slavery is a very simple syllogism. Premise one, all human beings are equal, or he puts it other ways, possess equal rights, or possess rights to themselves. He used those, all of those formulations at different times. Premise two, the blacks are human beings. Conclusion, therefore, slavery of the blacks or any human being is unjust because it is a denial of rights, a denial of the right of self-ownership. Lincoln, as you can see, was no relativist, that's clear. He did not believe that it was merely his value judgment that slavery was wrong. Rather, he insisted it is wrong, and a decent political society needs to recognize that. But Lincoln also knew that not everyone accepted his syllogism. In particular, the first premise had become particularly controversial in his day. So what then is Lincoln's argument in favor of his first premise? Actually, he made three chief arguments for universal human equality and against slavery. His first and probably most common argument was an argument from feeling. And he told his audience in 1854, your sense of justice and human sympathy continually tells you that the poor Negro has some natural right to himself. Later on, he says, repeal the Missouri Compromise, repeal all compromises, repeal the Declaration of Independence, repeal all past history. You still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery is wrong. Another place, he said, it is certain that the, grace, the great mass of mankind consider slavery a great moral wrong, and their feeling against it is not evanescent, but eternal. It lies at the very foundation of their sense of justice. So nature, expressed in the near universal promptings of the human heart, teaches that human beings are equal and that slavery is a terrible wrong. But nature is not the only source of this knowledge to which Lincoln appeals. As he said, my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal, and there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. By his ancient faith, Lincoln means, of course, the Declaration of Independence, a statement not universally known and delivered by the human heart in the natural feelings, but rather a proposition put forward in a specifically American document. It is Lincoln's, or it is our faith, not the faith of mankind in general. Where Lincoln's first argument appeals to universal nature, his second appeals to history, to a particular deliverance of our history. These two arguments, not contradictory of each other for sure, but they're nevertheless quite different. To these two arguments, Lincoln adds yet a third, very different from the other two. Where the others are in one form or another non-rational arguments, feeling or faith, this is a rational argument. Here's his, here's his argument. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may have right enslaved B, why not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? You say A is white and B is black. It is colored then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker, Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. 
You mean the whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks and therefore have a right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. Now, this is a very simple argument, yet it's also, I think, a very powerful argument. It's what's known in some circles as a dialectically necessary argument. It depends on a claim each I, each and every I, raises for myself. It's an argument that must be made in the first person. I feel, I know in my bones, my own claim to freedom, that I am free and want and need to be free. I cannot help but see this and assert this claim for myself. And Lincoln's reasoning makes me see that I cannot go on to affirm the enslaving, enslaving of another without endangering in principle my own freedom. To affirm slavery for others is to affirm slavery for oneself. As Lincoln said in another place, although volume upon volume is written to prove slavery a very good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. As you may have noticed, this argument also contains an important premise rooted in feeling. And in this respect, it's like Lincoln's first argument. But there is an important difference between the two. In the first argument, the so-called universal uh, uh, feeling is a direct revulsion against the slavery of other persons. In this third argument, it is a direct revulsion of that latter feeling than the former. After all, as he concedes, volume upon volume have been written to justify the slavery of others, but no one willingly chooses the state for himself. In a word, Lincoln's third or rational argument is much better as an argument, as a matter of logic, as a matter of clear thinking. Lincoln proves that one can accept slavery for any person only on pain of self-contradiction. Yet he knows that human beings do not consider the pain of self-contradiction as the worst pain that they might suffer. He once sat down to consider the case of the Reverend Dr. Ross of Alabama, a slaveholding man, a conscientious man of God, who came to ask himself the question whether his slave should be a slave. Dr. Ross, says Lincoln, can receive no direct and unambiguous answer from the Bible and certainly never bothers to ask his slave their opinion. And then, so, so Lincoln goes on. So at last, it comes to this, that Dr. Ross is to decide the question. And while he considers it, he sits in the shade with gloves on his hands and subsists on the bread that his slaves are earning in the burning sun. If he decides that God wills these slaves free, he thereby has to walk out of the shade, throw off his gloves, and delve for his own bread. Will Dr. Ross be actuated by that perfect impartiality, which has ever been considered most favorable to correct decisions? Well, the Reverend Ross <clears throat> is more willing to suffer the pain of self-contradiction than the pain of hard labor in the hot sun. Only if human beings generally found the pain of self-contradiction less tolerable than other pains would rational argument be as conclusive in practice as they are in theory. What makes a proposition true and what makes a proposition effective as a maxim of action are in fact quite different. This is the single most important truth about politics. This disparity sets the task for political leaders to make the true and the good also the effectual or to bring these elements as close together as possible. This is both what holds politics and morality together and what distinguishes them from each other. This is what separates the task of the moral philosopher and the scholarly critic from the political actor. So Lincoln made three arguments against slavery, an argument from direct feeling, an argument from our faith, and an argument from reason. The argument from reason was true, but as such ineffective. The argument from feeling 
was effective so far as it was true, that is, so far as the feeling that revulsion against slavery was felt. Reason ascertains truth, feeling prompts action. But the feeling against slavery for others is fragile. Lincoln knew perfectly well of many who held slaves without revulsion. Reasoning points to the truth of the anti-slavery position, but reasoning, reasoning is ineffective without the support of feeling, and feeling is unreliable. It is too variable, too uncertain in itself. It needs to be formed, focused, and channeled. In this context, Lincoln's other argument against slavery comes into its own. The argument from our ancient faith, that is from the American consensus on the Declaration of Independence. The fragility of both reason and feeling points to the need to cultivate for fundamental moral and political truth in the mode of faith. Like the ancient faith of God's people, this is our ancient faith, our inheritance from our fathers. Lincoln preaches the universal and rational truth of freedom as the particularistic and non-rational inheritance of this people and its history. He attempts to attach the reverence reserved for the most sacred and venerable things to the fundamental truths of political life. The task of his statesman thus, of his statesmanship, I should say, is thus to make the Declaration of Independence an object of an almost religious attachment. He took the truths of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, two men of the Enlightenment, who thought that rational argument plus self-interest would suffice to produce a decent and rightful political order, and he infused their truths with the spirit of religion and poetry. Now it should be clear why Lincoln saw that he had to counter the apparently statesmanly accommodation Stephen Douglas was attempting to sell to the nation. Douglas might perhaps gain some temporary political peace, though Lincoln doubted that, but his policy would in, endanger the conditions for future political health, for it would further wean the nation away from its ancient faith, from its unreflective belief and feelings in the universal equality of rights and freedom. More than the existence of slavery itself, in other words, is the spreading of the view that slavery is a matter of indifference, that the nation can and should be neutral. So long as the moral evil of slavery is reaffirmed, so long as the ancient faith is kept alive, Lincoln claimed in 1854 one could rest secure in the belief that the evil would be abolished from the land in the course of time. He knew that his intransigence carried risks, but he knew that the alternative was worse. He knew also that the disparity between what is true and what is effective meant that at any moment, the one who understands the relation between morality and politics properly must always settle for less than morality demands. But he must always keep the moral principle alive so that another statesman, another political leader, another day might aim at another, a more far-reaching conjunction of the moral truth and politically efficacious feeling. This task is different in detail for us today than it was for him, but in form, it is just the same. I can do no better than to close out my thinking about Lincoln by quoting from his speech against the Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case. The framers of the Declaration, this is Lincoln, uh, defined with tolerable distinction in what respects they did consider all men created equal, equal in certain inalienable rights. This they said and this they meant. They did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all men were then enjoying that equality, nor yet that they were about to confer it immediately upon them. In fact, they had no power to confer such a boon. They meant simply to declare the right so that enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. They meant to set up a standard maxim for free society which could be familiar to all and revered by all, constantly looked up to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and therefore constantly spreading 
and deepening its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. For Lincoln, this is what made America great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zucker. We have a tradition, <laughs> excuse me, in the program that we invite our undergraduates to ask the first question. So an undergraduate with a question, and if you might, could, could Edward, um, Edward, stand up and um, tell us who you are. Hey, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name's Edward. I'm a senior political science major um, at Notre Dame. Wow. <laughs> um, Hi, sir. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about Lincoln's policy of containment and what you thought um, his real intention behind that was. Like, Because some people say that Lincoln just said that out of prudence in order to get his um, first argument passed. Or some people say that he actually believed in containment and that eventually slavery would dwindle if it was contained to the South. I was curious if you had an opinion about which he really believed. Um, I don't think he actually believed either of those, <laughs> to the truth. Um, this is one of the major uh, themes, actually, of, of my book, and it's a somewhat complicated argument. But I believe that Lincoln came to see, uh, well, a couple things by, by, let's say, 1858, when he's debating Douglas. It's not entirely clear to me exactly by which date he came to this, these conclusions, but by 1858, he certainly had them. Um, one, I don't think he's... I don't think he actually believed that containment of slavery would in fact lead to the extinction of slavery. He does, he writes a letter in uh, actually earlier than 1858 in which he says, um, the appetite for the extinction of slavery, for the peaceful extinction of slavery has gone extinct. And therefore, even though he talks about the peaceful extinction of slavery in subsequent years in, in public, he, uh, I, I don't believe he believed in that. What he did believe would happen is that given the way opinion, especially Southern opinion had uh, developed, uh, he did believe that if the Republicans stuck to the policy of uh, forbidding the extension of slavery, that the deep South would uh, secede and that that would provoke a crisis, which in ways he never explained um, would lead, in fact, to the to a crisis that would lead to something serious about happening about slavery. In my book, I have a conjecture about what he saw uh, a possible scenario that he saw possibly leading to the end of slavery. But uh, I have not very. I mean, I can't with confidence put that before you, so I won't. Uh, but uh, it's in the book if you if you want to look for it. Um, uh, but he, that seems to be what he was looking for. So neither of the options that you mentioned seemed to have been what he actually had in mind. Although he couldn't actually, the, the policy that I think he was looking for, he couldn't talk about publicly. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't work if he did. So, okay. I should add, I mean, this this will be the most controversial part of your book, I think. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking so. That Lincoln, um, uh, uh, Invited might be too strong a word, but invited a crisis or allowed a crisis. Allowed a crisis, yeah, yeah. Another student question. All right, we can open it up to the whole group. Okay, at least Ryan. Yeah, can you wait for the uh, microphone? Yeah. Hi, Ryan Kerrigan. I was an undergraduate here a long time ago. Um, thank you for your talk. It may be hard to even answer this, but I'll throw it out there. How much does the um, the fact that the North won and Northern norms ultimately prevailed influence the analysis or the logic uh, embedded in the book? Certainly other scenarios could have played out. And I just kind of throw it out there as a, as a open-ended question. I mean, other scenarios like the... South could have won the war. Yeah, it's a stalemate, the South winning the war, you know, that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, and, and, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what, what your question comes to. I mean, so to what degree was my view about the conflict 
shaped by the fact that the North won the war? Is that is that what you're asking me, or? I, I guess the worthiness of his aims, of his strategy, of his ambition. Yeah. Well, you know, I I one of the things I try to emphasize in the book is that he was following, in my opinion, a very risky policy. It was risky for the country, and it was risky for himself personally. If the if things hadn't come out the way he hoped, uh, he could have gone down in history as the worst president ever, not the best, as the president who lost the union, not the president who saved the union and freed the slaves, but as the president who made the the enslavement of the slaves even worse, and 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 lost the union on top of it. Uh, so that was that was a danger that I think his uh, his policy did in fact. Um, Tempt. I, I, I believe, I mean, I believe two things on this. One, he wasn't as alive to that risk at the beginning of the war as he later became, partly because he went into the war expecting, as I said in my talk, expecting a short war that the North could easily win. Um, and he had many good reasons to believe that because population was much larger, the uh, military um, capabilities of the North appeared to be much greater. They had the ability to move troops around. They had all the, you know, the railroads were mostly in the North. Financial institutions were mostly in the North. And all the things that we know of are important for fighting a war. The North seemed to have the great advantage of them. And so he seemed to think that, and he also thought that the South had a tremendous overconfidence in itself and that that would lead them to drastic errors. So, um, I think at the when he went into the situ, in, into the war, uh, I don't think he any came anywhere near expecting it to, it to last as it did. I think the fact that he was much disappointed in his expectations is responsible often is responsible for that kind of melancholy that we associate with him in his uh, in his presidential years. He he um, you know he began. I think he had serious res, you know serious doubts about what what he had in fact undertaken. Michael, can you say a little bit more about why Lincoln was so willing to risk everything? He said, risk the nation, risk his own uh, name and place. Well, I think it wasn't not, just personal a, a ambition. Common of, uh, I mean, a combination of two things. One, I think he was, in fact, he uh, very early in his career, he gives a speech uh, in which he talks about great men with great ambitions. And a lot of uh, uh, readers of that speech have thought, you know, he speaks with so much sort of feeling and insight into these people. <laughs> one wonders, was he not one of those himself? And uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that conjecture because we see later on in his life uh, uh, moments of almost despair when he sees that his ambitions have not really come to the kind of things that he wanted. So, I'm t I take as a as a, an established point that he in fact had great ambitions for himself. Secondly, though, he also had great ambitions for his country, and he thought that America was a special place because of its commitment to freedom and equality, um, and that um, the triumph of the South, the triumph of the Douglas principle, would in fact undermine what made America worth worth loving. And so he thought that for reasons, public, not for personal reasons, but for public reasons, this also was the, the right policy, that America might survive as an entity on the Douglas policy, but it wouldn't be, you know, the kind of entity that was worth the survival, of it, at least that the, you know, the America he dreamed of was. So that I think is what, you know, those two, those two things together, I think, Drove, drove him or led him where he went. And, and that's because if, if Douglas's, Stephen Douglas's policy is followed, America would have lost the moral and political truth of the de declaration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Heavy. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Evie Bailing, one of the graduate students. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you can engage in a little bit of counterfactual history and give us some thoughts about um, how Lincoln might have approached Reconstruction had he lived to see it, given what you said about kind of the disparity between the true and effective. 
Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, we do have some indications of how Lincoln was approaching Reconstruction. He gave us, in fact, his so-called last speech was on Reconstruction. And he had earlier put forward a fairly detailed policy about at least part of Reconstruction. And as the second inaugural, I think, indicates, he's Lincoln is looking towards a very lenient kind of Reconstruction. And this was very definitely against the spirit of Congress. Congress had passed um, something called the, the Wade Davis Act. And the Wade Davis Act was very unlenient in his approach to the South. Um, that is, this, the spirit behind the Wade Davis Act was, you know, these guys are rebels, they need to be punished. Anybody who took part in, in the rebellion is going to have to suffer for having done so. <clears throat> Lincoln's policy was different. The most important thing was to try to reunite the country on as non-punitive grounds as possible. So he accepted almost all of the part, partisans on the South from retribution, except for the very top, for the very top leadership. Um, but even they, you know, he said to Grant, let them, <laughs> let them escape. You're not looking one day, let them escape. He didn't want blood. He didn't want any bloodshed after, after the war. So uh, it's pretty clear. He, I mean, we don't know exactly how it would have worked out. And Lincoln was hoping that if he was generous towards the Southerners, they would accept the new racial order that would have to come. And if maybe he was right, maybe he was a little over optimistic. Um, and, and what he would have done had this white Southerners resisted that new racial order as they in fact did, I, 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 I can't predict what he would have done exactly. I think it would have been more prudent and more, I mean, more generous spirited than what Congress ended up doing in its leadership of, of reconstruction. Evie stole my question, uh, oh, which is the alternative history. Perhaps I can ask you another one. Of all the different cultural depictions of Lincoln and the ways in which this evolving debate about his uh, virtues and vices, about his uh, racial progressivism or racial backwardness, what do you think is, is the most insightful? Or what do you think is perhaps the most uh, powerful depiction of Lincoln that can help shape a true view of his political vision? Hmm. Well, you know, in our course, we have, uh, as you know, but as not everybody in the audience knows, we've watched quite a few films about Lincoln with the idea of trying to get some sense of how Americans have looked at Lincoln at different times in American history what Americans want to see in Lincoln, or what the people who made the films anyway think that what Americans want to see in Lincoln. I, I, th I think I would, I would say of the, of the films uh, and cultural depictions that we, the uh, Spielberg film from 2012 is pr probably the closest to what, what, I would, what I would see as Lincolnian. Um, that is a uh, strong commitment to as opposed to many of the many of Lincoln's critics from more recent time, strong commitment to civil rights, strong commitment to emancipation, making it effective, that I think is important. A willingness to make uh, compromises with the world in order to get your good results, that sort of thing, I think. But also, Spielberg conveys something of that melancholy that Lincoln also, that Lincoln had even there. The war had ended, but I think the tremendous cost of the war in lives and limbs and money weighed on him. So even if he got a good result, um, you know, he had a, he realized a big price had been paid for it. <clears throat> Chris, right over here. Dr. Zuckert, I'm Isaac Kimmel. I'm a PhD candidate upstairs in the sociology department. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, can you settle an argument I had with my dad? Uh, <laughs> so he should be here too. I mean, so he can hear his side. I, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll recap it after. Okay. Um, so my dad and I were. My dad's a retired army officer, and as you might have guessed, a southerner from my voice. But um, we were talking about the impending renaming of a lot of the military bases in the South that are currently like Fort Hood and Fort Bragg and all the others yeah. that are named after Confederate officers, and. Um, 
my dad said that they should not be changed because um, you know Lincoln had this very lenient, very reunifying policy for Reconstruction, and uh, you know wanted the South to be able to retain its sense of you know cultural pride. And um, yeah. uh-huh. I disagreed, but I was I was wondering what would Lincoln have thought about um, honoring Confederate officers in this way, you know, for the U.S. Army in perpetuity. Yeah. I, well, I mean, you know, obviously these um, hypothetical or conjectural questions are always difficult to answer definitively, but I'm not really on your side here. Uh, it seems to me that Lincoln, we should make a distinction between being punitive and honoring. Um, it's one thing not to be punitive against them, but it's quite another thing to honor them. Mm-hmm. And I think he would have held back from this desire to honor them. And especially some of those guys, I mean, they really don't deserve honor, but um, I mean, some of them, like Lee, was in many ways an honorable man, but nonetheless, he was a rebel fighting in the co- in a cause against human freedom and human rights, and therefore shouldn't be honored for that. So that's where I think Lincoln would have come out. So get your dad here. You're, you're on my side, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, his policy was let them leave the country. Yes, let them leave. They the had country. to leave. Well, I mean, well, they could go high, go underground. I mean, or, or, he just didn't want to go after them. That was that was. Everything. They had to disappear from public life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, right here in front. Hi, uh, my name is Eddie Campbell. I'm a first year. A uh, PhD student here also in the department. Thank you, uh, Professor, for your talk. I, I was wondering, um, sort of responding to an initial part of your uh, speech about like maybe the second uh, school of criticism that Lincoln has faced recently from people uh, pointing out maybe backwards racial attitudes. I was wondering if, in your opinion, was Lincoln fundamentally arguing for equality of white people and black people in America? And how would you respond to those critics who point out something like maybe his attitudes towards interracial marriages or something like that? Uh, yeah. Um, well, this is again another fraught, another fraught question in the Lincoln world. And I would appeal to the idea of statesmanship that I tried to lay out in the talk, which is to say uh, the political leader needs to um, uh, realize that there's a gap almost always between the morally right full bore and what is uh, going to appeal to, polit- to be politically efficacious and appeal to the op- opinions of the people. Lincoln himself sometimes voiced what we would consider backward views about these things. He said he wasn't in favor of interracial marriage, et cetera. And in, in my book, I try to take, I, you know, there's some people who are completely apologists for Lincoln on all of these things. He must have had exactly the same views about these matters we have. I mean, possibly he did, but it's also possible that he didn't. And so it's possible. Lincoln himself spoke on several occasions of the power of public opinion to shape our, our opinions. And that if he should, in fact, agree with some of the widespread opinions of society, that seems to me very possible, very possible. And so I'd say, okay, maybe he did think, maybe he did think some of these things. But I would say, on the other hand, for Lincoln, the big question was fundamentals of equality as slave or not slave, you know. And let's take the first step, the most important step, and do away with slavery. If we were, and this is, this was Lincoln's point in much of what he was doing. If I came in front of the people of Illinois and I said, here's what I'm in favor of. I'm in favor of abolition of slavery, and I'm in favor of full political and social equality for the freed blacks. You know what would have happened? He would have been, he would have gotten no votes. Let, let's put it that way. So taking the more restrained position of let's uh, do away with slavery and worry about that other stuff later, that was the precondition for any kind of success. And I would say that's a that's in itself enough justification for what Lincoln did. Let's see, uh, in the back, Chris. Yeah. Hi. 
I, I'm George, I'm graduate of Notre Dame 1966. Okay. And in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the battle was to who would, who would be the U.S. senator, and they were elected by the state legislators, right. and they elected Stephen Douglas. Yeah. So another counterfactual, what would Lincoln have done had he not won the presidency against Douglas? Would Illinois have gone wobbly? Would it have stayed with the Union? Illinois' governor was oh, wow. from Kentucky. And Mary Todd uh, Lincoln also from question. Kentucky. All right. So the, the 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 this question requires knowing something more about the political, actually the political outcome. So actually, um, so Douglas won the the Senate seat, but he won the Senate seat because Illinois was mal what we've now called malapportioned. He actually won the popular vote. Lincoln won the popular vote in Illinois, and that proved to be a very important part of what made Lincoln um, an acceptable candidate for the presidency, because the task that the Republicans faced was to win that a tier of states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. If the Republicans could win those states together with the states they had won in 1856, they could win the presidency without receiving a single vote in the South. And that's basically what happened. But Lincoln was attractive because he had proved he could win the popular vote in one of those states, Illinois, in one of the states that was like the whole lower tier of states. And um, in the uh, in presidential race, the male apportionment wouldn't matter because, you know, the winner of the state gets all the uh, electoral votes of that state. So the total sum is, what's, is what counts. So if Lincoln hadn't, hadn't, I mean, if it hadn't been Lincoln as a candidate, I don't know, I think it, uh, Illinois, if it had been, say, uh, yeah, I, I think Illinois would have stayed in the Union. Uh, that, that's what I. That's what I think. The people of Illinois were were quite against slavery, for, uh, you know, as an institution domestically. They were less clear about how much they wanted to then bother the Southerners about slavery. But nonetheless, they were pretty clear that they were against slavery, and they got to be kind of resentful of the way the South was pushing everybody around about slavery at that point. So, so that's what I think, um, better or worse, yeah. Michael, I wonder if we, I can close um, with two questions. The, the first one is um, it, uh, request that you say just a few words about, Lincoln has these two speeches, the one at uh, Agricultural Fair in Wisconsin and his lecture on uh, inventions and discoveries. Mm. Um, and to my mind, these uh, your, your chapters on these speeches are two of the best in the book. Um, uh, can you say a little bit about your interpretation of these speeches and um, the goodness of human freedom that Lincoln um, uh, explores in these two speeches? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I, uh, I'll, I'll try. There, it's, again, ra a rather complex issue. But So Lincoln gave a speech. Actually, it was, it was after, just after the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He gave a speech on discoveries and inventions in which he kind of traces the history, the human history of inventions, uh, discoveries and inventions. And he, you know, when, when people discovered clothes, that sort of thing, you know. And so he, he traces this history and he draw, he, it's interesting. So you say, why, why is Lincoln interested in a question like this? You know, Lincoln, who's obviously got a, a moral political agenda. Why is he concerned with this? Well, towards the end of the speech, he comes to this, he comes to this conclusion that the, the, this track of inventions or discoveries and inventions has led to the discovery of human equality. It led to the discovery of human equality that because it ended up leading to the equalization of human intellect. And this was through things like a, a discovery of writing and then printing and, and so on. And so um, this, so he is in a sense a kind of, there is a kind of materialist causation here. That is the, the, the discovery of the truth about human beings depended upon these inventions. So, that, so that's one. In the, in, in the speech and the speech on, um, uh, to the Wisconsin Agricultural uh, Fair, you know, the people in Wisconsin invited him to come to their state fair and give a talk. And he begins the talk by wondering why they... <laughs> why he would be invited to give a speech on agriculture. He says he doesn't know much about it. And what he knew about it, he didn't like. 
So uh, <laughs> he's violating the main premise of American politics at that time, which is don't say anything harsh about farmers. You know, they're by far the largest. And Jefferson, of course, had set this example of saying if ever God had a chosen people, it were the farmers. Uh, but but, 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 so, but Lincoln doesn't flatter the farmers in that way. But his, his, the point of this speech, interestingly, is to talk about something he called thorough agriculture or thorough agriculture, um, according to which he argued we could um, double or more the productivity of agricultural land if we did it better. And he talks about, again, inventions that would make it better, like steam plow, power, power machinery for farming. And he saw this as a big advance and there was on the horizon, he thought. Um, and one of the implications of that is that there would no longer be as much pressure for expansion. That is, he saw the, the sort of um, drive towards manifest destiny, that is that America's destiny is to go all the way to the ocean on the one hand, and the drive towards um, taking property, taking territory in Latin America, uh, et cetera, is another aspect. He was very much against that kind of expansionism. Um, but the most important thing that he saw was that <clears throat> the, the modern situation had opened up for human potential. We could no, we, we, uh, being a farmer, being a peasant, no longer meant being consigned to a kind of intellectual serfdom. Uh, an, an intellectual, uh, how, how should I put it? I mean, not the, poss the possibility now existed to combine labor like agriculture with intellectual development. And well, that's one of the things he thought was so good about state fairs. It was an opportunity for people to get together and talk about well, in that case, mostly agriculture, but there were other things. And he seems to have in mind things like book reading groups and, and uh, book clubs, stuff like that. Um, and so in that speech, he brings out that the point of the modern regime, the modern regime which combines equality, liberty, and technology, those, those three things, is the development of humanity, not, no, no, not, not consumerism, Nothing like that, but the development of human potential, intellectual development, and so on, which is possible now in these kind of regimes that was not possible ever before in human history, except for a very small segment of the society. And that segment was misled about what, what it was all about <clears throat> by the inequality that prevailed. That is, they came to think of themselves as superior beings and therefore not moral in the full, in the full sense. So that's what, I mean, that's what Lincoln was looking forward to or what he affirmed as why, why this kind of regime was a good thing for the world and why the spread of it, not by conquest, but by, you know, voluntary choice, why the spread of it would be so good in the world. There's not really a better place uh, to end than that. But let, one final question. Uh, what are you going to teach for us next fall? <laughs> <laughs> we, we brought sisters looking out of retirement to come teach this, this fall. And we're hoping you'll come back again. <laughs> You're going to have to pay me better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just finished reading the book myself. It's just out this week. It's, as I said, it is um, possibly... Um, one of the best books ever written on Lincoln. Uh, thank you, Professor Zuckert, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you all. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I yeah, appreciate your comments, too. <laughs> uh, I know some folks will have um, uh, questions for Dr. Zuckert. I talked to my hand. Please come up and ask them. And students in the class, thanks for us.